Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. John Duyard, and welcome to the Life Spa Podcast, where we prove the ancient medical wisdom of Ayurveda with modern science. And today we have a really amazing guest. She's a repeat guest. She's been on the show before, and we had her on for her first book, um, you know, What to Eat for How You Feel. This book is amazing. We went into detail about that. She's written another book just as amazing and as beautiful. You just want to have this out all the time. It's called The Joy of Balance. And we're going to talk about why the new book, what's different about the new book, and everything about Ayurveda cooking. Divya has probably the best Ayurvedic restaurant, I think, in the world, um, in New York City, which is just an amazing place to go. If you're ever there, you've got to go see Divya's Kitchen and eat there. Um, and she also has an Ayurveda cooking school, her master class. I think people are signing up even as we speak. Um, and if you're interested in Ayurvedic cooking and you're interested in learning about Ayurvedic cooking, um, then take Divya's masterclass. That's just how you're going to do it. Um, so welcome, Divya. It's great to have you back. Um, tell us a little bit about your new book and, and what's, what's new about it. What's different? Why? What's Because I know you have a totally different concept in the second book. Yeah, thank you, Dr. John. It's so great to be back. And it's such an honor. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I wrote the second book. Second cookbook is more about cooking by ingredient. And I organized it according to ingredients. So you have categories, like a chapter for grains, chapter for lentils and beans, chapter for vegetables, chapter for dairy, for nuts and seeds, for fruits. And this is how the ancient text of Ayurveda categorized food. So there is the palavarga, the section about fruits, and they describe the properties of different types of fruits that were growing back then. So I organized the book in a similar way with much less content because the, <laughs> the Sanskrit text, they've listed so many, many, many ingredients, which is very difficult to cover in detail in one book. So for example, in the chapter on grains, I feature, I, I profile different ingredients. So for example, I profile barley. I know you love barley, Dr. John. <laughs> so I profile barley in the way that it's explained in the Sanskrit text. So what's the predominant taste? What is the metabolic effect? What's the post-digestive effect? What are some of the qualities? And then I bring the modern, the modern in sense of the, the practical application today. So what's the season, the best season to eat barley, or uh, what are different types of barley, how to find them, um, or how some cooking tips, digestive tips, when to eat it, when not to eat it. And then I give you a really delicious recipe with barley. <laughs> so the idea is to help the reader deepen their relationship with different ingredients and learn when to use them in their meals and when not to, and when to keep them on the shelf. And the idea of using these foods also to bring balance, right? That's the idea, right? So you can use your foods more medicinally, if you will. Yeah, exactly. But to know when to use it medicinally, you need to know what it does, right? So what are the properties of the ingredient? And that's what I try to do. For example, with barley, I was just talking about barley to a friend who is recovering from surgery. And you know, after you recover from surgery, there's so much commotion in the digestive system, they can barely eat anything. So Ayurveda recommends drinking barley water because it's very nourishing, but it's cooling, it's diuretic and get, gets this chemical toxins from the medications out. And it's very soothing. So so when when to do that, right? So if you know that barley has a cooling effect on the body, if you know that it has a diuretic effect, um, if you know it also, Vaidyamishu used to say it has like a binding effect on toxins. It kind of binds them. So if you know this, you would use it, but there might be instances when you don't want to use it because maybe it's too heavy for you to digest. So that's the idea, understanding the digestibility and the properties in terms of actions, like what actions this ingredient has on the body, then you can choose when to use it and how. Did you, did you dive into um, when these foods are harvested and, <clears throat> and therefore how they kind of 
you know, provide the mostly foods provide the antidote for the extreme of each season, right? Like squirrels eat nuts and seeds in the winter, and they're the antidote for the cold and the dry, right? In the summer, so fruits and vegetables, which are cooling for the for the heat of summer. Mm -hmm. Some of these foods like barley, um, I know I did that in my first book, The Three Season Diet about, and in the back of the book, I created, created a glossary the best I could to talk about where these foods were originally grown from, because oftentimes where they were originally grown and the harvest time of them was completely different than what we do today. Like everything exactly, yeah. was in the fall for our convenience, you know, um, where corn, for example, was originally harvested in Central America, the maize was, and it was right, it was harvested in the spring, right before the rainy season. So it was the very dry grain, mm -hmm. right before the very wet season. So nature had a plan. We decided to hybridize. Now it all harvests from the, in the, we have the driest grain right before the driest season, which is sort of like, you know, here we go again. We, we like to mess things up when it comes to nature, right? Did that play a role in how you prepared the book or looked into it? I definitely considered some of this and I explained this in some instances. I would say, so don't you use it more in this season, not so much. I, there is a seasonality in the profile. I don't dive into great, great detail about it because, you know, also my publisher, Ritsali, they were like, this is a cookbook. <laughs> We want the recipes. Right. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so it it's meant it's meant for the just the common reader, the home cook. It's not meant for the student of nutrition. Right. But but it's but it it kind of my hope is that it will increase um curiosity in the reader to dive more and to learn more <clears throat> to dive more into the nutrition part of and really like Maybe read your books. I love your book, uh, the Eat Wheat book. It's such a revolutionary book. <laughs> you know, so you explain uh, the seasonality there in great detail as well. So, yeah, I, I always hope that my little recipe books will increase curiosity about Ayurveda and nutrition. Well, I think, you know, I always say the best way to learn Ayurveda is to experience it. And there's no better way to experience it than actually eating it. Um, and then you really feel different. You know, you, you know, you talk about how when you eat Ayurvedically, I think the key, and that was a big part of your first book was, you know, how do you feel when you eat that food makes a huge impact on if you're, if you're aware of that. A lot of folks aren't really aware of that. But if you actually put your attention on, God, I really feel good. I feel lighter after that meal. I'm not feeling tired. I don't have a food coma. You know, I'm not bloated. I'm not gassy. I feel really good after eating that food. And I think that, you know, you know, and then when you understand that when you feel good, you know, I think what you try to do in the, in the second book was like, Hey, guess what? Here's why you feel good is because we're actually balancing you. We're actually supporting your digestive process, making your digestive process stronger as opposed to just feeding you with stuff that your sense that your, that your taste buds seem to, enjoy right and i think that's the 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 beauty of it i think that that um that most people when I, in my in my practice you know i see people patients all the time and you know i ask them well what makes you feel better and what makes that symptom worse or mm -hmm. you know and they haven't oftentimes they just don't have radar on that they don't it's notice just, yeah yeah they really don't so i think what you're what you're trying to do is get people to you know um and that's the difference, I think, between Ayurveda, right, is that it's really making food um, an experience that um, is really for all the senses. And you have to be present and be there. And, and you know, you're really, you're, you're, um, you're having a relationship with your own consciousness and the consciousness of the food. And there's an intelligence that's emerging, an uh, intelligence merger that's taking place. Your bugs, which are intelligent, and the food bugs, which are intelligent, we're having an, a merger. And that's what makes understanding Ayurveda cooking so beautiful. And I think what you've done is you keep taking it deeper and deeper while giving us these really super easy, really wonderful tasting recipes. So people, you know, can be more curious. I think it's great. And then they can want to learn more about Ayurveda cooking and, and then hopefully take your class and learn about your school and, and everything. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about your, your school. Yeah, well, you know, so as you mentioned, a big piece of it is the awareness. 
So we are not taught to relate the way how we feel to what we eat. We just it's just not part of modern culture. So what I try to do with especially with my classes, I, I love to teach. I just love to help people learn. And part of our teaching is also to have an experience of this awareness. It's just notice when you eat this, notice how it feels in the body. Does it calm you down? Does it stimulate you? <laughs> you know, does it clear your mind? Like bitter foods are very clearing for the for the mental fog, for example. So notice the taste of each food as you're eating it in your meal. So when you start paying attention, it it becomes it, it it's like you open a whole new world of food. Like the same food will never taste or look the same to you. You'll have a completely different experience. And that's what we try to do in, in we, we just started in-person cooking classes, which is exciting because we used to do this in New York City all the time before COVID. And then, then we stopped, we moved online. And now we're resuming our in-person classes as well here in New York City. But because there were so many people who, especially readers of my book or people who I've met online, and they would say, I want to study with you. I want to study. I want to learn this in depth. And, and I was like, okay, what, how do we do? How do we serve people this way? So we created the master classes. So there are professionally produced videos, very high quality with a lot of learning activities, workbook. You can, they're broken into smaller segments and you can listen and watch and do the little homework. <laughs> um, so we're just, these classes are, I would say they're like the culmination of my teaching career because I was, we were able to systematize it. We were able to systematize it so that there is, it's very easy to follow and we use motion graphics to describe the very theoretical concepts, sometimes like dosha, agni, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure that out. So we use visuals also, we use, we use a lot of B-roll and I, I think the master classes are a lot of fun to watch and they kind of bring everything together. Like even if you have studied Ayurveda in relation to food, when you watch the classes, it all comes together in a very system, systematic way. Mm, wow, that's that's fantastic. So, give us an example. It's winter now. It's kind of been a crazy winter for a lot of folks, in different parts of the country. Um, you know, what should people be eating? What should they be drinking? Yeah, we're coming into the later part of winter, right? So it's the second part of winter, which is usually we call this the kapha season. So there is more. There's more heaviness in the body. Um, you may you may feel a little more sluggish. So um, this is when we start to lighten up, <laughs> like lighter grains. Um, start to really reduce the heavier foods, the heavy dairy. Gradually start using less fat in the diet, which in the winter we need a lot of fat, a lot more fat and start to lighten up. I, I started incorporating millet in my diet, like maybe once or twice a week. Millet has a very, and I profile millet in Joy of Balance, my, my new book. So millet, there are different types of millet, but in general, millet has a very drying property and it has a scraping property. Like it, it helps to scrape, Dr. John, what's the technical medical term of of that sludge Lehena. that accumulates mm -hmm. so say that again so uh, millet has a very scraping property so it scrapes the sludge that accumulates in the digestive tract it just takes it out um, at the same time it's very nutritious but it's very drying so like i have a very vata body and the the, the radiators are still on, the, st the heat is on in the house, so it, it creates a lot of dryness in the air. My skin gets very dry, but so I'm very careful with millet. So whenever I cook millet, I make sure that I cook it with little extra ghee just to not be too drying for me. For some people, it, it's not as drying as like vata constitution. So 
Uh, millet is one of the grains. I'm definitely reducing wheat, <laughs> you know. So it's uh, starting to switch the grains from the wheat. And I mean, barley is still very good, but kind of lightening up a little bit more buckwheat, a little bit more millet and switching from using more basmati rice, for example. Uh, instead of basmati rice, I've been using more red rice, so which is a little more fibrous and delicious. I love red rice. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, little things like that. Yeah, it's really neat how, like in Ayurveda, you can change the property of a food just by how you cook it. You can add some ghee to a meal that would be drying and then it becomes more, say, you know, vata balancing. You can take vegetables, um, you know, in the wintertime, which generally aren't really available if you're living only off the land in January in Vermont, let's say, you would have to go, okay, well, there's no vegetables, but we do have vegetables in the grocery store and they are good for us, but we, but then that's in that, in the wintertime, if you cook them with ghee or olive oil, you find that they, you can really change the properties uh, and make them more vata balancing. Of course, you can eat strictly vata balancing food, which are the in-season foods, but you can also have a variety of foods and not feel like you're, you know, if you ate only off the land, what was harvested, oh, well, come spring, it would be pretty harsh for most people. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what makes Ayurveda kind of unique is you can, you can just, you're really looking at sort of tweaking the foods to give you the properties you need to balance the dosha that is active or extreme in that season, you know, vata in the winter, pitta in the summer and kapha in the spring. So, so um, that's a really neat way. Are there other examples of that? You can think of how people can like, as they're cooking, they can kind of tweak this particular meal or whatever it is to be more vata balancing or kapha balancing as we move into the springtime. Yeah, yeah. You're so right, Dr. John, because that's exactly what Ayurvedic cooking is about, is using the combination, like what what other ingredients, like what spices, what fats, what other ingredients do you use to combine to balance the, the properties of the main ingredient, but also cooking methods. So, for example... I love cabbage. I mean, I grew up in Bulgaria. <laughs> we had a lot of cabbage. And, um, and cabbage is amazing. I mean, it has amazing healing properties. It's very nutritious, but it's light. It's low calorie. It has this scraping effect. It, it, it has made, I mean, you, you, you can tell us about the nutrition value of cabbage. But it's also very airy and very vata aggravating. So in Joy of Balance, I have a recipe for braised purple cabbage. So the way I make it vata balancing is first of all, the spices, but also the method of cooking. So I braise the cabbage. I cut it into big pieces. And then I love cooking it in a clay pot. I have a bunch of clay pots at home and I, I especially for braising, I like to braise in a clay pot. So first I saute the cabbage with cloves and black pepper and ginger, which are very balancing for vata and they reduce the gassy effects of the cabbage. Then I add braising liquid, which is like a vegetable stock. And I add a few herbs. I make like a bouquet of herbs with fresh thyme and tarragon and they both reduce gas. So, and, and I put that, and then I put that in the oven cover it, and then I braise it for about half an hour. And then the cabbage comes out so tender and it's so sweet. And my vata never gets aggravated by eating cabbage that way. So, mm. And it's so beautiful. You just look at this glistening, beautiful purple <laughs> vegetable. And then I serve it with some rice and some sauce and things like that. And it's just delicious. And so that's an example of how you can use a vata aggravating vegetable, add spices, add ghee or olive oil, fat to balance also the, to ground it, so to say, and then use the braising cooking method, which is, has a liquid to create a vata balancing dish. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, the same principle of just simply cooking versus non-cooking your food, you know? And that's a big principle in Ayurveda that a lot of people debate 
whether you should cook your food or have raw food. And, and, um, you know, when you, you, you know, you eat that, that cabbage raw, it's going to be gassy probably for most anyone, you know, yeah. and you eat that the way you just described cooking it or like a borscht or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just feels so good in the stomach and it's really warming and soothing for your vata. So what's your take about like the whole raw, the, give me the Ayurvedic take on the raw versus cooked whole idea. Well, I mean, there's so many opinions. So in Ayurveda, you speak about this so much, Dr. John, it's like, it always, whether it's good for you or not, it always boils down to whether you can digest it or not. So, because if you're not able to digest it, that semi-digested matter will clog the channels in your body. So it's ultimately not good for you. You will not be able to absorb the nutrients either fully. So, so Ayurveda explains how raw food is usually harder to digest for most people because it has to cook extra in the stomach, so to say. It's also very rough and it's cold. So it just, nowadays, so many people have, it's almost like a chronic vata imbalance. <laughs> you see this throughout, uh, almost everybody has some kind of vata imbalance, which means that cold and rough food will be contraindicating it, it will it will make things worse so yes and my answer is always if you can digest it go for it but if you can't um, then consider more cook cooking also the season the season is also part of it um so obviously in the winter season it's a little hard i know with my body it's like i look in the salad and i'm like no thank you <laughs> it doesn't feel right <laughs> But in the summer, I would enjoy a salad. Somehow, I, I I enjoy salad. So it it also also depends because I meet people who can eat a salad in the winter and they feel fantastic and they can break it down. Right. So there are there are always exceptions as well. Well, there's many levels of raw. You know, a salad. You know, is you know lettuces and things are generally on the easier side. I I wouldn't even hardly call them roughage or insoluble fiber, even though they are. But when you're taking sort of raw cabbage and raw broccoli and raw vegetables that are really insoluble fiber, mm. um, they really are, we call it roughage because it is really rough. And when you think about when nature would provide that, the insoluble fiber, which doesn't break down or digest, <clears throat> is available in the summer, you know, during those hot seasons where, where, um, um, you know, those foods are generally on the cooling side, but they're, they're, you know, and, and that roughage, um, uh, well, let's go to this insoluble fiber, which we have in this, in this, in the winter time, fall harvested, like nuts and seeds and chia and oatmeal and all the grains, if you cook them, they become mushy. Well, that's soluble fiber and that's slimy and that's vata balancing it coats, heals your intestinal tract, right? So you really want to get the right fiber in the right time of the year. So the insoluble fiber, which is going to be, have to be cooked. You can, yeah, you have to cook it. The grains are just, you're not going to eat them um, or get very far with them if you don't cook them. And that really is vata balancing for us, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and that is so important to understand that there's two types of fiber. So in the summer, a little bit of that roughage is good. You're going to be okay with but to eat that insoluble fiber in the wintertime um, is going to be really, really challenging. And, and again, vata aggravating for us because it does take, um, you know, that food is not designed to be necessarily digested. It's designed to kind of rough and clean the villi of your intestinal tract and scrub, like you said, the scraping lehana property of cleaning, cleaning, cleaning your intestinal tract, which is good in the spring and the summer, but in the winter, this is a rebuilding time. You see, you know, mm. store fat, nutrition, protein, rebuild energy reserves. And you don't want to be in that time of time where you're, you know, doing deep, deep cleansing at that time. It's a nourishing time. As we go into the yeah. spring towards the equinox, um, then the cleansing season is open, you know, and that's when we want yeah. to really get start cleaning and scrubbing and doing those things because those impurities can accumulate. 
Yeah, I like how you said it. The cleansing season is open. We're open for cleansing. <laughs> yeah. Right, and the exactly. body really opens up. I mean, you feel like, oh, I need to get rid, I need to shed some stuff out. And also, I think also in the summer, because we're so much active and we're outdoors so much more. So it's, it's just easier. We're moving a lot more in the summer. So it's easier also to handle roughage. So one of my favorite topics in Joy Balance is the idea of being mindful when you eat, you know, that old saying that says, if you eat standing up, death looks over your shoulder in Ayurveda. So it's not a good look when you're eating on the run, going, 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 which is sort of unfortunately how everyone does it um, in our culture. It, it, it's sad. Um, and taking time to eat and relax is a really big deal. Talk to me about what you wrote about enjoy a balance in that regard. Yeah. So that's again, part of increasing our awareness in our relationship with food. And um, I share a couple of meal practices, mindful me, mi mindful, mindful eating practices. And the first one is about really sitting down and presencing yourself to your plate and looking at it, smelling it, and trying to eat with your fingers. So when you touch the food with your fingers, unless it's a soup or something, just touching it and putting it in your mouth. So it creates a direct sensory connection <laughs> between the food and and your digestion. It's actually, when I lived in India, there were my Ayurvedic doctor would say, oh, just eat with your fingers because it will be easier. It will help your digestion that way. And um, so also the nice thing about eating with your fingers is that it's, it's kind of the morsel portion. So sometimes we put too much food in our mouth and then we have to chew and chew and chew. And I, I know you love to talk about chewing, but when you eat with your fingertips, it's like you get the right morsel size and then mindfully chewing it um, and noticing how the tastes of the food unfolds, the flavors unfold in your tongue and not not speaking, just being in silence. And then, and then also the other thing that I feel it's important is to pause and really feel the enjoyment of it, right? If the food is good, it's like, oh my God, this is so good. And, and, and just bathing in that pleasure or feeling like, I always feel gratitude also. It's like, oh, wow, thank you. This is so good. Because I struggled this for, for many years. When I joined the ashram, the yoga ashram, we were taught um, detachment, you know, practicing detachment and don't get attached to the sense objects. <laughs> it's like the yogic way of thinking, which is, of course, very valuable. But I was kind of doing it artificially. And even though I somehow didn't allow myself to feel that pleasure of eating or smelling something nice or looking at something nice, um, and I realized later on that if I connect this to the divine source, it's, it's, um, it's very nourishing. It doesn't break my spiritual practice or whatever. So, so for me, this was a journey to really pause and feel the pleasure of food and eating and, and experience that gratitude, um, uh, express the gratitude. And eating in that way, it, it actually, you know, when you eat like this, believe it or not, you'll be satisfied with less amount of food. And that's one way to overcome overeating and obesity. Because when you just put things in your mouth mindlessly and you're watching something and it's like, it's so easy to overeat and to, or, and to gain weight. But when you actually presence yourself and and feel and let the mind also eat with you and be satisfied as well and then at the end you're actually satisfied with smaller amount of food and and you don't feel heavy you feel energized you know there's, there's so many studies about what you're talking about uh there was one study i always say you know how when and what you eat but i also did a, a, a some research on where you eat in other mm. words they study where they had people who were in um, sort of nursing homes and they had to meet in the cafeteria and then they had to meet the exact same meal in a really nice cushy environment, warm and cozy kind of place. 
and the nutritional value, these, these people wanted to gain weight because they were thinner and older and they gained significantly more weight, got so much more nutritional value when they were relaxed and had that more beautiful environment, atmosphere when they ate the food. Also just ritual, saying a prayer before your meal, that's been studied to actually really strengthen digestion, how people lose weight for the same amount of calories that people would eat, people who would ate, who ate with a ritual lost more weight or lost significant weight compared to people who didn't do the ritual. So there's something about like setting up that like, okay, now this ritual is almost like a trigger that says, now we're going to digest our food. We're going to relax, mm. take time. You know, and in India, you know, eating with your fingers is, is, is such a beautiful thing. And for, for a lot of the pitta body types out there who are eating on the run, gobble, 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 they can't stop, they can't slow down. Just sticking your finger in your food and eating it that way. You can't like turn on your phone. You can't flick the clicker on the TV anymore. Yeah. You can't open a book. You just are sitting there eating, which is like a thing that we should do as a, like a full on 100% focus event. Not like, you know, I need all this other stuff going on in my life while I'm eating my food. And so it's, it is a, a time to really, and the fingers really work just to kind of slow you down. When I was in India, I used, my teacher, well, of course, when you're in the eat with your hands, because there's just no silverware anyway, so it doesn't matter, you have to. So I'm eating with my hands all the time. And, and, and I was with my teacher and probably six months into my Ayurvedic training with my teacher, and I would just follow him around every day, eat with him every day. He looked at me and goes, and I'm eating, right? And he goes, what are you doing? And I go, what? I'm eating, why? And he goes, goes you don't use the flick. I'm going, what, what, <laughs> what do you mean? What are you talking about? Flick, right? And he goes, he goes, you have to flick the food when you eat. Because I would eat it. And if you eat with your hands, the one thing about this is it's very hard to get it in your mouth. And then if you have a white shirt on, it just gets like, I would just soil all my shirts like every day. And it was, you know, a bad look really. And, and so he goes, when you eat your food, you have to flick it in. And I'm going, oh my God, you're telling me now after all these time here with you, there's a flick, there's a technique involved here to make it not kind of, you know, so how you do it, I'll give you the secret technique, but you, you take your finger like that, like there's my thumb right there. And you take your thumb and you flick the food like that. So you have to flick it like that. So you take the food and you flick your thumb and it, that's how you get it from your fingers into your mouth. You have to flick it with your thumb. Like you said, it's a smaller little piece, right? But it doesn't have to, so it's not like you're taking these big, huge bites. But, and in India, they don't tell you this and they do it so fast. You never ever see the flick unless you slow motion it down and then you dissect it because they don't want anybody to like all the Westerners to make a mess of themselves. It's like a, it's like an inside joke. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, but the point is, is that um, it's a really cool technique and it really does bring you into the now when you're eating your food. And most of us are not in the now. We're like, you know, a million places mm -hmm. at the same time. And it's a, it's a really a, a beautiful technique. And it also, when you relax and take time, it activates your rest and digest parasympathetic nervous system, which is really flicking the switch that says, now I'm digesting my food. When you pray or, or have gratitude for the food or whatever, however you do it, that flicks the switch and says, I'm not being chased by a bear. I'm not running up a tree. Life is not an emergency. I am now in a place where I can eat my food. If you are on the run, go, go, go with your mind. You have fight or flight. Don't digest anything switch is turned on, right? So really dumb if you really want to get rid of your indigestion, which is 80% 80, 80 of the population, is to be eating on the run really fast. Go, go, go. And just yeah. turn it off. Flick the, the relax and calm switch, even if it's just for 15 minutes while you eat, and then flick the other switch back on if you have to. But that's, um, that's really important. And this also you know, talk, brings me to the idea, the point of the six tastes, which have, you know, in Ayurveda, those tastes are called rasa, right? And rasa is lymph and rasa is emotion and rasa, rasa is taste. And the study of rasa is rasayana, which is a study of longevity. So, yes. so the six tastes are really important. And you write a lot about it, about that in Joy of Balance as well. Can you talk to me about what you wrote about the six tastes? Yeah, you know, as you're talking like I, the flick is definitely a technique <laughs> I'm taking away from our conversation. But <laughs> also, as you were talking, I was like, oh, Dr. John, maybe write an article about eat here now. You know, it's like, like really presencing about the food. It was so fascinating what you share. 
Yeah, the six days is so interesting. I I've been studying lately with the Dinacharya uh, Institute, uh, Dr. Bashwati's master classes. We're going through Ashtanga Hridayam, and we spent like more than 12, 12, like four hour, three hour sessions just on the six tastes. And I wow. was thinking, oh, I know the six tastes, sweet, sour, salty, pungent, bitter, stringent. <laughs> it's like, I know the six tastes, but actually it Ayurveda goes so much deeper into not just what the taste is, but how each taste triggers a physiological or mental or emotional response in the body. So for example, foods of sweet tastes are not just the sugary things, right? Uh, foods of sweet taste are called madhura in Sanskrit. These are building foods. So these are the foods that build our tissues. They're usually heavier to digest and they're very nourishing building foods. So, for example, rice and almonds are building foods. Ghee is a is a sweet food, a food of sweet taste. Uh, some types of meat are also of sweet taste. There's so many. I mean, so most foods, most of the nourishing foods are of sweet taste. So, I was like, oh wow! And and this is also foods of sweet taste provide the sense of pleasure and satisfaction and feeling loved. That's why sometimes we crave sweets because when we don't feel loved and we're kind of depressed and just the pleasure of eating something sugary sweet is 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 there, but then we have to deal with it, the consequences. So, um, and then uh, sour foods are usually digestive foods. And when you put something sour in your mouth, it just, it kind of invigorates your palate. It, it, it kind of clearing, but invigorating at the same time. So all these fermented foods that we eat as condiments, right? The pickle or the the sauerkraut or or the lime slice, whatever. This they really help digest. They cut through the they cut through the heaviness of the of the sweet foods or the fatty foods. So it, it's just amazing how each taste has this emotional, mental, physiological response and. And this is not taught in culinary schools. It's not taught in nutrition schools either, unless you're studying Ayurvedic nutrition. So I feel that there is so much, there, there's so much scope for scientific research just on the effects, effects of each taste. It will be so fascinating to see how, I hope there are scientists who, who, who are doing this because it will be so fascinating to see, to read about their findings. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's you know, really, I think understanding the six tastes, and of course, Ayurveda says, right, eat all six tastes should be there because each taste has an emotional quality, like sweet is, you know, satisfaction and and sour is, you know, um, uh, very stimulating, like you said, um, salty um, is very warming and can create you, make you more aggressive, um, you know, bitter foods are, are uh, you know, uh, very, very cooling. And, um, and they have sort of a, um, you know, too much of that food can make you, you know, sort of bitter and astringent foods can make you more withdrawn or retreated and mm -hmm. pungent foods yeah. can you, uh, more extroverted, things like that. I wrote an article, a couple of articles about that. And when you have too much of one or too little of them, I think it's really important to dig into those, to get into those details and realize that when you're eating, you know, you, you're, you're feeding the emotional palate um, not just your physiological body, but you're feeding your body emotionally as well. So having all six tastes there um, is um, just provides that level of satisfaction. So when you finish the meal, you don't think, oh God, I need a dessert. You know, I have to have mm -hmm. that. I'm not satisfied. How many people finish the meal and go, I, 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 I'm not, I'm, I'm full, but I'm not satisfied, you know? Exactly. And and that's, that's where we oftentimes go, well, like, oh, would you like for care for dessert? And you're like, not really, because I don't need it. I'm already trying to lose weight. But I, I, you know, when your brain doesn't feel satisfied, it pulls down the menu and goes, how do I get out of this hole that I'm in? And it's like dessert is on the top of the list or a cup of coffee or whatever that injection you can get is. The brain knows how to do it. So that's when willpower, when willpower, there is no such thing as willpower in those situations. Your mind is like on overdrive and it says, I'm just going to have it. And 
I'll, you know, I'll think about it in the morning and go, God, I really shouldn't have had that dessert last night because it made me feel bad. And, you know, now I'm, you know, you know, I'm trying to lose weight, whatever it is, you know, but during in that moment when you're when your dopamine levels, your reward chemistry is crashing and the brain wants to get back up on top of that mountain. You know, you just don't want to get into that situation and how you get into that situation is by eating improperly on the run, on the go, bad food, processed food, which yeah. doesn't fully nourish you. And then you're left wanting something else, even though you're full. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, I think there we all struggle with our digestion and and like lifestyle problems. Right. The physical or the health issues that come from our lifestyle. And when you think about them, so many of them can be corrected completely free of charge. <laughs> no medications no only if we change the way we do things right the way we eat the way we exercise the way we sleep the way we spend time in nature it, it only if you could if we could change this completely free of charge like gradually change our habits we can completely restore most of our health issues it's just so it always amazes me but how do we get to that point of having the determination to make that change in our healing process. You know, my my the way I look at that is, and it's a really great point, is that um, Ayurveda isn't something that you have to do. It's something that you prefer to do, desire to do, want to do, because when you do it, you're aligning your biological clocks with nature's circadian rhythms, and you're starting to go downstream with the current, mm. and you feel good going with the current. When you have to turn the boat around and paddle upstream, it feels good for a little while, but eventually you got to stop. But when you're going downstream, you could just like take a nap. I mean, it's, life is you know, you know, merrily, merrily, merrily down the stream, right? It's easy. And that's what I think Ayurveda is. Now, I think what happens in the Ayurvedic world, because there's like a million little Ayurvedic tips people can give you to do, and you can spend your whole day doing Ayurvedic things, yeah. which can overwhelm you very easily. And I think when I got into practice, boy, in 1984, I graduated in 1986, I got into Ayurvedic practice full time wow. from that point on. Um, uh, you know, I was like, you know, here are all these Ayurvedic techniques you can do. And people would come back to me sometimes and go, maybe you come back three, four years later, and I go, God, I went to see you three years ago, and you gave me all this stuff to do. I wasn't ready for you. Like, you gave me so much stuff. I couldn't do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, God, I really screwed up, you know. So I learned over the years that I had to just, just give them the one or two things that if I gave them that, they would feel better, experience mm -hmm. feeling better, and then want to do it because they felt better doing it. Yes. And then once you open that door, then it's not a challenge to um, to change your patterns when you're doing something that makes you feel better. Yeah. And, and I think that's the key to Ayurveda, which I learned over the hard way, you know, over a lot of years of trial and error. That's what we call it a practice, right? But I do think that's the way to do it properly because the 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 the, the beauty is that we want to align ourselves with the like the with the rhythms of nature, with the circadian rhythms, like the birds are flying south. They're not like, oh God, we got to fly 10,000 miles in a week. It's going to be like a mess. I'm going to be, you know, it, is, it isn't like that for, for anything else in nature, except for us. We make a big, you know, stink out of doing the things that are good for us. We make them so hard. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I agree with you step by step. And really like finding that the same is with improving your diet, right? So find find one one thing that you can improve in your diet that you're ready for it work it work, you feel confident it's not too stressful that's the other thing doing too many changes in your lifestyle can bring a lot of stress which is not healthy so yeah, yeah step by step but i think it also starts with the desire to do it not just saying oh you know i i just too much work i'll just take the pill <laughs> <laughs> and not change yeah. anything. Yeah, that 
that's a sad place for, and, and we're encouraged to do that. Cause when you go to the doctor, they don't tell you to change any lifestyle tips. They just say, here's the pill for your whatever blood pressure or this or that. And unfortunately that just sweeps the real problem under the rug. And what Ayurveda is really about is, you know, going, going deeper. But there are things in Ayurveda, like you and your book talk about pizza, right? So what's the recipe for the Ayurvedic pizza? Well, okay. So I like to Ayurvedize recipes. I call it Ayurvedize. In other words, I apply Ayurvedic principles to a recipe to make it more digestible. So what I first do is I look at the concept of the recipe. So pizza is a concept. There's so many varieties of pizza. The basic concept is you have a crust. It's like a pie. You have a crust, you have a sauce, and you have toppings. So now the problem with modern pizza, especially if you buy it in the store, is the yeast the yeast in the crust. So the and then the white bleached, fully processed flour, and I don't know what other additives they add just to the dough. So that becomes hard to digest. Uh, so I'm like, okay. How can I make the crust better? So I don't cook with yeast, like baker's yeast. Um, I just use a little bit of baking powder to use it as a leavener. And I use spelt flour. It, I always make my flour fresh. We have a grain mill at home, so I, I make freshly milled spelt flour. Or you can just buy the flour in the store. So it's a whole grain flour. And instead of canola oil, I would use olive oil for the crust like that. Um, and then for the toppings, so most shops, pizza shops, they always use canned tomatoes. So, because that's what makes pizza profitable. You use canned foods, you don't cook anything on site, you just mix it up, chop it up and, and bake it in an oven that's 700 degrees. You know, I have a friend, she works at a pizza place. The oven is 700 degrees, Dr. John. I know you don't like that. Wow. So, I never knew that. <clears throat> And because it bakes the pizza in two minutes, it's very quick, boom. And it makes the crust perfect, this, that, um, but it's 700 degrees. So um, so I I don't I don't use tomato sauce in, in Joy Balance. I have a recipe, I call it Ayurvedic ketchup, which is with fresh sweet tamarind and cranberries. And it really looks like ketchup, it looks like tomato paste. And it's delicious. So I use that as a sauce. And then I use some slivered asparagus. I call it asparagus pizza. And some freshly made paneer cheese and some olives and some fresh herbs. And it's delicious. It really satisfies my craving for pizza. We just made it in class the other day for our culinary training. And I don't I, I bake it at 400 degrees. That's it. And it takes maybe 10 minutes to bake, but it's fine. You know, it's a little longer but it still comes out delicious and it satisfies that desire for pizza. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's, that's so good. And I think that, you know, you can make it, you can add so many different toppings any way that you like, but like you said, you know, if everything's out of a can and it's canola oil and bleach products, and it's really just a processed food cooked at 700 degrees. So, so if it wasn't processed before you put it in the oven, it was after you put it in the oven. You know what I mean? Anything yeah. just got completely destroyed. And, um, you know, I think that the, 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 the other cool thing about Ayurvedic cooking, which I think is so interesting, is that they always talked about slow cooking, not zip zapping it, you know. Mm. And, and when you slow cook something, everything changes quality. The change of the quality, the, the, the quality changes over a very slow period of time. So it's not a rapid you know, microwave kind of change, but also there's microbes that are in the food that we eat that are, you know, protected when you cook food slowly under, under low heat, the best you can, whenever you can. And, um, you know, I think that's something that is something I've been writing a lot about lately. And it's really the new research is that when you think about us, right, we're, what are, what are we, if we don't have our microbiome? Like who would we be without the bugs? <laughs> Think about a caterpillar. Who would the caterpillar be without the bugs, right? Or the mosquito or any living creature without the bugs, who would they be, right? So then we take our food and we spray it with this exercise. So we basically sterilize our food in before we get it, right? So we're giving, taking away the plant also, 
has a synergistic relationship with the bugs that it attracts in the soil. It's where the bugs come from. They come from the soil. So the plants are pulling microbes, attracting microbes. And the research shows that the microbes that attach to those plants are almost always have the same property, medicinal property of the plant itself. Oh. So it isn't just the broccoli that cures your cancer. It's the, it's the bugs that are attracted to broccoli that have the same properties that create a synergy and intelligence that makes the plant whole. So when you spray and eat a non-organic food, you're basically um, eating a sterile product, which, doesn't, which is missing half the intelligence. In the herbal world, everything is extracted and extracts are used, are extracted with alcohol of some sort and they're sterile. They're literally sterile. Mm -hmm. So we took this plant with all these amazing bugs that have the same medicinal property of the, of the plant itself. We sterilize it and then give you a chemical product. But when you use the whole plant, which we do at Life Spa, all of our herbs are all whole, all, all organic and the whole herb. That, and we actually test the mug, the microbes when we get the product, we make our formula and we, to test them again after we make the formula. And when you put the plants together, there's an explosion of good bacteria that takes place all the time. Wow. We see that this becomes like a, a like a like a an entity, a, a, a probiotic entity that's coming from your food. So when you eat foods, different foods, you've got this like this like party going on in your gut, yeah. and not in your gut with the right bugs for the right season because you eat seasonal food and all that, which is, makes it so different. And that's the beauty of Ayurveda. It understood that. It understood those bugs are affected by our emotion, our impressions. If we yell and scream at a can of yogurt, the bugs are going to change. Mm -hmm. When you are stressed, the bugs inside your gut, the bugs on your food you're eating are going to change. They're going to they're going to they're going to feel and change and morph according to those impressions, right? So it's just a beautiful concept of slowly cooking your food, slowly eating your food. And having a relationship with this subtle process of cooking, as you cook it, you're cooking it with this love and really understanding of what you're doing. And then when as you eat it, you eat it that way. And I think that's the beauty of what you do and why everything you do is so successful because you're teaching people how to do that, which is like not known. You just get stuff and drive through and they throw a burrito at you as you drive by, you know, it's like, boom, eat it on the, you know, yeah. that's amazing really that we're still here pulling that off you know <laughs> i know it's just we i i feel this we're reversing the culture of fast eating like everything should be fast only five ingredients ready in 15 minutes i feel that more and more people are realizing this is not working for me right yeah. so um yeah so that's why i love i love teaching and i love showing people that it's possible it is possible to like in the master classes, I have a whole class on how to set up your kitchen because some people don't cook because the kitchen is just not an inspiring place. It's a mess. It's not organized properly. Um, or how to, how to really, how to store your vegetables, how to peel it, how to prepare it, how to, how to have a very personal relationship with your food and not just like do something that you have to do and go on to the next thing. So how to really personally connect with it. And I I love this. Next time I cook, I was like, oh, wow, bugs. <laughs> I can't see you. I can't see you, but I know you're there. You definitely know they're there. So one more question that, that always comes up, and it's about leftovers, right? I get all these mixed opinions about leftovers, and should you eat leftover food? So you know, in India, they didn't have refrigerators, right? So obviously you can't eat leftovers there because they didn't have refrigerators. So what's your take? Well, I will share my personal experience with it because the, the Ayurvedic recommendation is to avoid leftovers, especially when something is cooked with fat, could be ghee, could be even the best fat, ghee, olive oil, uh, what to speak of the bad fats, but when you refrigerate it, when you reheat it, it becomes very hard to digest. So I had an autoimmune disease. I had the initial stages of fibromyalgia years ago. And um, and then this is when I met my main Ayurveda teacher, Vaidya Mishra, and, and he was like, okay, stop eating leftovers. Because I was, I'm a chef, I'm like, I can I cannot throw away food. <laughs> it's like, 
And there was a point when I was so stingy about not, I would cook too much. And then I was literally even eating leftovers every single day. And there was so much inflammation and, and pain and lack and fatigue in my body. So when I, I'm like, okay, I'm determined. This is my healing process. I'm going to try no leftovers. And, and when I started cooking just, just as much as I needed for myself and my husband and, and eating fresh meals, I felt such a big change. It just from that, I was still sick, but just from that, it, it just felt such a relief. I started feeling that the food is really supporting my healing process hmm. because before it was just, the food was just something that um, I had to eat. So here I'll eat whatever is in the fridge. <laughs> you know? I wasn't paying so much attention. I, I wasn't connecting the food to my healing process, but when I started doing that, I felt such a big change. So um yeah leftovers are hard to digest so what what i would do is i would recommend is just make them the exception of your meal so when there's not an option it's probably better to eat your leftover food from dinner yesterday than to eat out some something that's really bad <laughs> so um maybe that's better for you but don't do this every day yeah, I do think you have to you have to pick your battles. I think it's a good point that you made. If you have a you know if you can actually if you're going to make something and and store it, you know if you have to mix sauces with it, eat do that when you actually eat. What you do it with the portion that you're going to eat, and then you know if you have to put it in the fridge, it doesn't have all the sauces mixed in with it, and you can actually you know maybe you just make the sauce fresh for yourself the next day, so it's a little bit easier. You don't have to do the whole the whole thing. Like you have pasta, you don't have to you know store the whole pasta with all the sauce in it. You can just put the sauce in that you use and eat and then put the pasta mm. away. And that might be a better way to make it last a little bit better. But I do people, I think that that they're, that they're um, for a lot of folks, it's just impossible not to because we are already just doing double duty, you know, raising a family, going to work, you yeah. know, taking the kids here and there. It's just so hard not to. And like I said, nobody wants to throw away food, even though, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, there's what is it um i just wrote an article about this about the waste that we have in food it's just amazing and, oh yeah you know and most of the food waste that we have on in, in our country comes from um the consumer us you know in our yeah. kitchen just throwing stuff away that we either overcooked or overbought or went yeah. bad in our refrigerator and we throw it away so it is important only to not only you know cook what you can eat but also buy what you can actually consume before it actually goes be a little more selective about instead of overbuying all the time because we just end up yeah. throwing it away. It's it happens really, with better management. So I actually speak a lot about this in the master classes. So we have a section on time saving tips in the kitchen. Um and I think if you because I'm in the same boat, I mean I have a restaurant, I'm a chef, but I don't cook all the time. I create recipes, I train, you know, I do so many other things than just being in the kitchen. And I get very busy too. But I find that it's very helpful if you if you're able to kind of manage it, you can manage your meals. So if you're able to plan a little bit better and organize your kitchen in a way that it doesn't take you a very long time to cook and then um maybe even get help, plan your shopping like that, plan your prep work ahead of time so you could chop your vegetables or whatever, you make the sauce the day before, make the spice blends on Sunday like that. So I give a lot of tips about uh, in the master classes about how to how to make more time for cooking and, and eating. Because Dr. John, also when you look at it, I mean, we're so bombarded with social media. I'm the same thing. I just take my phone and it's like, I can spend half an hour just browsing through Instagram. And it's like, oh my God, I just wasted half an hour, you know, uh, that I could have used in the kitchen, for example. So, so it's also looking at restructuring our day and looking at where, where we're wasting time also. There's, there will still be plenty of time to waste for the relaxing stuff and the mindless stuff that we all do. But if you make this a priority, I think it's very possible to incorporate more fresh meals into your diet, even in a very busy family schedule. I've seen this. I've coached so many people through this. Mm. But again, it's a shift, right? Yeah. That you, yeah. you're willing to make. 
Well, I feel like you you are helping so many make that shift. And, um, you know, you have your mastery class. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how people can get a hold of you and learn more about the master class and sign up for that. Um, how does all that work? Oh, well, you're welcome to visit our website, divis.com. <laughs> so divis.com, you can learn more about our restaurant. Uh, we have products and you can click on master classes and read about it. So the master classes are five classes, a four part series of introduction to Ayurvedic cooking where I explain the theory, then setting up your kitchen, then how to make staples. Like I show how to make ghee, cultured ghee from scratch. So actually culture the cream, churn it into butter, make the ghee uh, and other staples like paneer cheese or almond milk, coconut milk like that. And the third class is about spices and cooking with spices. So spice blends, ways to methods of cooking with spices that I show in different recipes. And then the, the fifth class is seasonal cooking with Ayurveda. So we speak about the, the, the little bit about each season, how to connect each season to the six days of foods that we spoke about. And then I show a re seasonal recipe like, for each season. So we go through, it's, it's like a, a real cooking. <laughs> I mean, there are many recipes. It's not just talking. So, um, yeah, and, and Dr. John, there is a, a special code. Everybody who's listening to us can get 100% off, uh, I mean, $100 off the masterclass. It, giving you a special discount. Just just use the Life Spa uh, code, which you can see in the write-up. Oops, And um, it, it's more than eight and a half hours of produced video. <laughs> Which you can wow. which you can watch at, at your own time. It's all broken so into segments. So there's five classes, right? Mm -hmm. And all that total is about eight hours of solid information. Yes. Wow. And it com oh, yeah. it comes with a very detailed workbook. Um oh. where you if you want to go deeper, there are also practices and reflection yeah. that you can work on. And it really goes, it really brings my cookbooks to life. So what I explain. Yeah in what to eat for how you feel enjoy your balance it all comes to life in my presentation video presentation oh nice, nice. So <laughs> nice. i love this so now i want to take it so it's awesome i think it's <laughs> it sounds, sounds really really brilliant and everything you're doing is wonderful everybody know her new book the joy of balance um pick that up it's a great great wonderful book it feels really good just like everything she cooks feels and tastes really good her first book the um what you eat for how you feel these books just feel great they're loaded with great information it always feels great to connect with you and talk to you adivia thank you so much for everything you do and um you know we'll have you back again with your next book i'm sure there's another one coming so, so. <laughs> well thank you dr john i i always i always see you as a mentor and i always feel that i'm I, I'm, I'm following in your footsteps and I always look up to you to, to really pay forward all the knowledge and blessings and all the kindness that I always receive from you. So thank you. <laughs> well, that's really sweet of you. Thank you. Blessings to you. You take care. See you again. Thank you, everybody. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.